The longest war this century ended just a few months ago. And since then, there's been almost a silence about Vietnam in the American press and on television. After defeat and humiliation, people just want to forget. But the people who live here in the town of Fort Smith, Arkansas, aren't being allowed to forget, which is both ironic and sad, because towns like Fort Smith in America's heartland spilt most of America's blood in Vietnam. Poor white southern boys didn't burn their draft cards. They gladly went to die for God and country, or whatever it was that they went to die for. But now, in the first summer of peace, the war has come home to Fort Smith yet again. It's like a dream, because every few days out of the sky come hundreds of Vietnamese, soldiers, sailors, pilots, politicians, priests, crooks, bar girls, and just ordinary frightened people, touched and convinced by the American cause, whatever that was. There's 24,000 of them on the edge of town, just waiting for the good folks here to come and sponsor them. The problem is that every one of them is a living reminder that the boys buried in this graveyard died for nothing. But now the boys, the ones who survived, are together again with the Vietnamese, each eager to please the other, almost as if two decades of mistrust and killing and lost opportunities had never happened. I didn't think I'd ever see any Vietnamese people again. I left in 1968. More than 120,000 Vietnamese fled to America, and only a third have been settled in the community. The rest still languish in all army camps, and those who can't find a sponsor to take them will eventually end up here, in Arkansas, which is about as far away from Vietnam as the other side of the moon. God only knows what the future holds for this confused and frightened old man. He and people like him are all that's left of an American investment of 20 years, and 56,000 lives and 140 billion dollars. Okay, kids, let's go. Follow me. Come on. Let's go. All right, come on. Big jolly GI, cute crying Vietnamese kids, together again, one having lost a war, the others their country, and perhaps at long last needing each other. This is the United States. Welcome you, Vietnamese. All those years, the Americans told you to fear the communists. Then at the end, they told you not to panic, but you did. And so here you are in Fort Chaffee, Arkansas. Sorry about that. Welcome to Fort Chaffee. Built in World War II, closed down in the 50s. A temporary home for most of you people, a permanent home for some of you. But don't be sad. A few of you may get lucky and find a lost daughter or a wife or a brother. Maybe the young woman I watched trying to claw her way over the wall of the American embassy in Saigon is here. Maybe the Marines who booted her back into the crowd finally relented and let her over the wall. But don't be too sad. Compassion was never a big selling product in Vietnam. So maybe they'll sell you a different brand here in Arkansas. This is what they call processing. The photographing, the interviewing, the fingerprinting, as the great American melting pot prepares to receive its latest ingredients. dead ones go. A brutal remark, perhaps, but an honest memory of a war for which America has only Fort Chaffee to show. Just as the French still have an entirely Vietnamese town near Bordeaux as a melancholy reminder of when they gave up trying to control Vietnam 21 years ago. You know, this is my first wife's son. 
she still is in Saigon with my four children. And I'm here. It's too bad, isn't it? This man, whose wife singing you here, was a movie star in Saigon. He left because he knew he had to leave. He had made propaganda films for the CIA's infamous Phoenix program, under which 60,000 South Vietnamese officials were murdered for not doing as the CIA told them. Now, like all of them, with his memories, he waits for a sponsor, like a child awaiting adoption. Of course, they all have their past to live with, and waiting in the huts day after day, week after week, month after month, is tedious and destroying. It's a time of terrible anticlimax, of lying on your bunk and reflecting about what might have been had you stayed in Vietnam, and of wondering if a husband or a mother or a child left behind in the panic are safe, and what might happen if one day you decide to forsake Fort Chaffee and go back home. So you were the one who was chosen to go to America? Mm -hmm. Why? Why didn't you want to stay in Vietnam? You know, because when I leave, I don't think the visa come to Vietnam. I think when I get United States for, um, you know, not a long time and I can come back to Vietnam, I don't think I have to leave my country away, you know. I don't think so. I think I can come back to Vietnam soon. Are you very homesick? Yes, very homesick. I cry every day, every night, when I miss my, I think of my family. So. Are you here all alone then, all by yourself? Yeah. Do you have friends here? No. I would like to go back to Vietnam, but uh, I'm afraid because... Uh, but your family's there. Mm, I know that. But I don't know if I go back to Vietnam, I can see my parents. You're worried that you might not see them? Yes, that's right. What do you think they'll do to you? I don't know. My family uh, fed me up when I left uh, them behind. I think I have a responsibility to look for them, to look after them, but I, I love to them. I feel guilty. One of these days, we return home and uh, take a path to uh, improve our country. And uh, I do ask the, all the young men who have evacuated out of Vietnam should, uh, should do that way should go home and help. No, uh, if they have a professional now, they should go home and help. Maybe one day, if I came back to my country, I can fight again. Do you, re do you really think that you'll fight again? Yeah, I really think I will fight again one day. How? How will you fight again? Maybe. With what army? If we still mercenary for us, we still, if uh, somebody can support us for finance and army fund, we can fight again to, uh, to gain our country. Aren't you dreaming? I'm not dreaming. I think it's true. But the dream is long over. The reality is getting a sponsor, or rather getting the right kind of sponsor. I'd like to have me just a few of them Vietnamese chicks, wrote an ex-Marine sergeant to Fort Chaffee. Just put them in a kit bag and stick them in my war locker. Have to be young and good figure and not bad teeth. Judge them like you would a horse. Perhaps it's the fear of ending up with someone like that Marine sergeant that causes people to change their names and vanish back into the security of the huts on the day they are due to take the oath of allegiance and leave. Do you fly a kite? Do you fly a kite? Do you fly a kite? Yes. Oh. <laughs> All right. Pie. Pie. Pie is good to eat. Pie is good to eat. Do you like pie? Yes. All right. Pie is good to eat. Pie. 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 Pie.
like talk. expect to go over to someone else's country and have them take me in because the people can usually make it at home if they will. A lot of people likes to run to the United States because it looks kind of lucrative to them. Why bring more trouble in when you still got trouble? What would you do with these people? What would I do? I wouldn't have brought them in the first place. Back to Vietnam. That's where they're wanting to go. They want to go back. They belong in their own their own people, just like the colored people. I would have died before I'd left my country. Yeah. Fort Smith, a typical, real friendly southern town with an 85% white population. Some of the Vietnamese will settle here. The majority will be scattered throughout the United States. Perhaps it's not surprising that many of them would rather live in a little Saigon in Arkansas than risk the embrace of a way of life which after 20 years left only bomb craters and beer cans back home. Well, I don't have anyone on my farm. I'm all by myself. And I need somebody there to clean the house, do a little cooking, when I come in from work, I'll have something to eat, you know. Yeah. So you don't have any wife or family out there at the moment? No, I'm, uh, I'm divorced. My wife see. left. So you're all by yourself on the farm? Right. Now, Rose has got a nine-year-old son. How is that going to yeah. work? Well, I think okay. uh, later on, he'll be a lot of help on the farm around there. Well, you might put him out with the... Uh... Cows. Cows, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what do you think they're going to say when Rose moves out? Well, my own personally friends, I don't think uh, there'll be nothing said. I think they'll like her. Sure do. But, of course, we'll always have the gossip around uh, town, you know. <laughs> but I don't care what they say. I really don't. I don't care what they say. Because I, I like her myself. Why does Rose want to go with you? I, I... Well, I assume she just wants to... Uh, Maybe us, uh, we might get married someday. And she wants to get where somebody she likes. Could you tell them why you want to go with me instead of the other sponsors? I like Fred. You like Fred? Yeah, she well, likes me, she said. Why do you think she likes you, Fred? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. But I like her. I've talked with uh, several out here while I've been out here. And of course, uh, Dr. Graham, my uncle, uh, he met her first. And uh, he seemed to think she'd be real good for me. You know, we must realize that everyone is not an island by himself. We have to live with people. People have to live. And if I am fortunate enough to uh, have a, an extra meal and an extra place to keep somebody and uh, feed them, and that's all they require, uh, uh, and, and have them live with us and try to train them and educate them and uh, get them to be good Americans, uh, we, I'm only helping my country. What happens if, you mentioned being good Americans, what happens if they want to go on being good Vietnamese? Fine. That's, that's the advantage choice. of this yeah. country. That's the big that's... advantage of this country. You can be what you are, and, but you're still a good American. If you are a good of whatever nationality or ethnic background, you are still a good American. And that's what this country is all about, in my estimation. In if my who estimation. we sponsor want to come and live with us in the first place, then they know that what we're going to do is help them and teach them. And we will not stop them if they have any relatives or friends that are in this country or anywhere that they want to write to. We'll we will make sure that correspondence them is kept up and even visitation privileges to our home or we can take them or send them to where they want to go if they have friends and relatives. They're human beings, they're part of our family and they have the right to do the same as we do. What hurts the most is Americans that are against 
the refugees and people sponsoring the refugees because no American was an American except the Indian and they're the worst treated in this country. Go on. To sponsor a Vietnamese, you have to convince one of the voluntary agencies, which are mostly church organizations, that you are of good character and full pocket. The Carter family have sponsored two girls, and now all of them live together in Fort Smith's suburban splendor. They want to be sure the government's prime concern is that these people will not become welfare recipients. And so they want to do uh, a small amount of checking. It really is not very large, but they do ask you what business your husband is in or what, you know, if you have a job, what it is, so mm -hmm. forth, and if you are financially able to keep them up. Otherwise, it is very simple, and they do not ask much else. Uh, so it's not legally binding at all. I mean, it is not legally they binding. can leave and you can kick them out. That's right. If they, they know, in a sense, well, to be brutal, they're at our mercy. They, they have no other way of getting out except through this method of being sponsored. And the sponsorship is just, it is a thing that you are helping them until they become financially independent. Uh, like one of the girls that I'm sponsoring, I'm paying her way to go through college so that she can become financially independent, which will take, say, two years. What were the emotional problems when they first moved in? And they still are suffering. I call it sort of a traumatic shock. Some of these people that we talked to out there said that they had two hours notice and they left. And that, to anybody, is like going to the moon in two hours. You know, you barely have time to say goodbye to your parents. What has their inclusion in your family done for you, personally? What are you getting out of it? Well, I don't know. I can't... <laughs> I can't, uh, what am I getting out of it? I don't know that you could say it that easily. It is, uh, it's a nice feeling when you're doing something for somebody that obviously appreciates it. I'll say that. And, that, uh, and you know that you're obviously helping somebody out that otherwise is going to be in a terrible jam. <laughs> no, he's just on the floor. Let me see. Let us go over here and get some fruit. Which way? Okay, I think it's going this way, Judge. Where the coffee is, and it always has a side thing. But in the beginning, there seemed to be quite a lot of objection. People put up signs saying, Go home, gooks. Was that representative of most people here, do you feel? It wouldn't have been my idea of uh, a reception. My idea would be a reception to receive them like the Lord would receive us. He has. Uh, the Lord is no respecter of persons, and neither am I. They're human beings. I'm a human being. He made me one way, made them another. We all have the same blood, the blood of Adam. And uh, I love them just as like I'd love you or anyone else. Well, I mean, I, I didn't mind it because those people were in a war-torn country anyway, and I, I really didn't mind it myself. Mm. We heard a lot of that there was a lot of objection at the beginning. Not me. I don't object to the merit. Yes. Because I know I wouldn't want to be aware facing those bullets. That's the way I feel about it. They have to live someplace, and they couldn't live in their own country, so. I have no objection. Do you think they'll fit in with the community? I imagine so. Give them time to learn the language and all. Do you think most people here will accept them? Well, I don't know. I don't know how they would. Only one I know I wouldn't mind it, but a lot of people I talked to haven't been too awfully glad about them. Heard some bad comments on them, so. But I haven't said nothing, so I, I think they're pretty nice. <laughs> Yeah, we need some. Ashton? Where's Ashton? Ashton there. Go get him. What kind of fruit do you all like? Plums. I'm not asking you. I'm oh. asking what kind of fruit do you all like? I, I believe most people just won't forget about it. It's all over. Have you forgotten about it? Uh, except for the lines that were lost. Did I don't, you th I don't think anyone will forget that. Uh, of course, I wasn't there, but. You still have a feeling for boys. What, what did you this, think when it was all over? I mean, did you, did you feel... Well, I never did. Many, most familiar. Americans didn't understand that war. Mm. They were opposed to it. I was opposed to it. Yes. I didn't understand why we were there. And I thought the sooner we got out, the better. And I just thought, well, you know, what can I do? Well, there's one thing I can do. 
Yeah. We didn't win the war. No. They left. And uh, so maybe I could sponsor somebody. Yes. And Nam happened to be one that was by himself. Do you think he'll, he'll turn into a, a good all-American boy? A, a Who good... knows? He certainly wants to be. Mm. He wants to be. Hi, Nam. How'd you sleep? Did you sleep? Yeah. It's good. Sorry. What time did you get home on your bicycle? Yeah, my bicycle. I got midnight. Uh, midnight. The young man sponsored by the Spears family next door is called Nam. They can't remember his other names. His first job in America is at the Fort Smith International House of Pancakes. Nam left all his family in Saigon. He fled because he was frightened, and his regrets and his hopes are now kept well inside him. In three months, Nam has gone from chief accountant in a Saigon bank to dishwasher in a plastic food palace. In other words, he's fallen from near the top of his own society to the very bottom of the American heap. He's now a member of a minority, like the blacks and Spanish speakers, and the other Orientals who wash dishes in endless pancake houses across America. When I told Nam I'd been in Saigon and knew the bank where he was chief accountant, his face almost lit up. I don't know why I'm here, he said, but I guess I'll have to stay. All three of you are almost classic American soldiers. You're all volunteers, you've served several times. Are you still as proud to be an American as you were when, the, when you first went to war in Vietnam? As far as is, is my, my ideology goes, it's shot, you know. The respect I once had for, the, for America, for the people that ran it and things like that, that's just about down the drain. And they're going to have to show me, the politicians, uh, the Army, the Marines, the Navy, all of them are going to have to show me again that, you know, CIA, that they're worthy, that they're worth, you know, fighting for, respecting, and what have you. We go over there, you know, okay, we're going to stand behind you. We stood behind Vietnam, and then we pulled out, left them standing. It's like, that's like pulling the, the you know, the crutches out from a crippled person. It's the same thing as, well, you know, my opinion, of the whole thing. And it, uh, it was a great loss. I lost a lot of real good friends over there. I would like to sponsor a Vietnamese family, but I'm not able, you know. I'm retired military and I'm going to school, and, and, uh, but if it was all able, I would sponsor a Vietnamese family. I have no hostilities towards those people whatsoever. I think they're a beautiful people. I really do. I'm still proud to be American, don't get me wrong. As far as I'm concerned, it's one of the greatest countries in the world and always will be. I mean, it's got its faults, but uh, it's still good. When I left Saigon on April the 29th, the last day, I heard an American helicopter pilot say, just get on board and don't look them in the eyes. By them he meant the Vietnamese, the soldiers who fought until the ammunition ran out and then died for nothing, and the children, bombed and burned, and then finally bundled onto bogus orphan flights, often without the consent of their parents. Publicity stunts meant to appease guilt in the West and political desperation in Washington and the people kicked and clubbed away from the embassy walls on that last day. As the helicopter pilot said, just get on board and don't look them in the eyes. You know, I served in World War II. I was in the jungles for three years, in Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands and Philippine Islands. I fought. I fought for this country. I shed blood for it. I'm a disabled veteran. I don't feel we lost the war. Nobody won the war, nobody lost the war. A lot of people were killed, it's unfortunate, because of the leaders, because of the leaders. Uh, vanity, the vanity of the leaders is what caused all this. this uh, neither one wanted to lose face. Uh, as several presidents of our own presidents said, I don't want to be the one who was president and we lost the war. So he carried it on and sunk more money and killed more people for the next president to take on the burden. Why, did, why should we have lost a war in the first place? We weren't in a world war. We were there trying to be good Americans, good people, trying to help them. We didn't lose or win. We're still winning because we have brought them here and we are trying to do something for them. Some of us who attacked the war in Vietnam year after year were called anti-American. The charge, of course, was ridiculous. I suppose what I always found difficult to explain was the dual personality of Americans in Vietnam and at home. They had during the war, and they still have, a kind of all-consuming innocence, an innocence both lovable and lethal. In their hearts, the good people of Fort Smith, Arkansas, wanted to win the war in a simple, ruthless way, to wipe the enemy, whoever they were, off the map. 
They weren't allowed to do this, and so they knew their sons were dying for nothing. And yet today, in this deeply conservative town, there are no signs saying, go home, gooks, as I expected. Instead, there is much generosity and charity and decency and confusion. They still don't know why they couldn't win the war and why the world turned against them. Their innocence, both lovable and lethal, is exactly as it always was.